Sometimes a film podcast has to swallow its pride, I think. Welcome I, to Fic... <laughs> I think we have actually done our first share of swallowing already oh, previously yeah. here. Uh, tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> well, or maybe, or maybe don't. One can say a few words about pride and this podcast. Oh, if you do it that way. Welcome to the Flick Lab and the King Harrier edition. Because, you know, before we started this podcast, we came up with different titles for the show. Before it became the Flick Lab. Now, one strong contender was King Harrier as the name. This is an anagram from the names of Garry and Henrik, as it happens. While King Harrier sounds fun and original, I thought that it has, unfortunately, certain... Unintentional sexual connotations. Yeah, the kink has been perverted from its original meanings to be now something that is only sexually peculiar. But fear not, all listeners, our co-host tonight is still Henrik. <laughs> and has the weight of representing the whole northern Finland right now. He's, the whole northern Finland is on his shoulders during this episode. Don't miss the mark now, you know. <laughs> If I would make this uh, connection right from the previous episodes where he gets into the mood of the particular movie we are going through. So coming from that angle, you know, yeah, you're probably dressed up in leather. So we're off to a good start here. Yeah, Desperately trying to unzip my mask. <laughs> so the kinkiness has already commenced. <laughs> Way ahead of you. <laughs> okay. Thank you for the correspondence, and uh, back to the studio in southern Finland. So we're two Finns analyzing films every week from every genre, and I, we do mean any, as will be quite evident in this episode. What, what is this cast, Henrik? Well, it's an all-around film podcast. That's yes. one title we can uh, give it to this podcast. Well, just you wait until we actually manage to cover the old, like, four these religious films. Or actually, even better, you know, the silent film version of The Ten Commandments. Which lasts like five hours, I bet. <laughs> actually, the with sound version is way longer. Yeah, the, the, but, the silent uh, version runs only for three years. Uh, well, <clears throat> as you know, we like to be thorough in this podcast, and as I have mentioned before, if we watch something like The Ten Commandments or Ben-Hur, then the background work would involve reading the entire Bible. So that's not coming anytime soon near this podcast. It actually, you know, require us to travel to the actual historical site and reading the Bible there while desperately trying to carve some stone tablets of our own. Which will just unhumorously end up me climbing the rock of Gibraltar and scratching an iPad with apes. Anyway. Yeah, you, you have to start that uh, someplace. <laughs> Why did we choose this film for tonight? Because you pushed this one on to us. Oh, that's an edgy idea. <laughs> I never, never thought of that. You know, I guess this is our... It is our desperate attempt at covering all kinds of genres in this podcast. If we are not going to be concerned about particular film genre, then we are... Just we should just eat them all. So here we are. So enjoy. But fear not our listeners. This is not probably going to be a habit. Or I don't know about you, but this is something that we could do like annually. Well there is a lot to cover in for example the golden age of porn, to be sure. Hmm. But I'm not I'm not certain if we are touching the right movie here tonight. Well, this has been on countless top 10 lists, listed as the best porn film of all time. All time, Henrik. That's why it's on the show, so it should be quite, quite valid. And for the life of me, I can't understand why. So, 
would you be going for something like uh, Deep Throat, of course? Well, Deep Throat does have the Mafia versus FBI angle behind it. So in that sense, it does merit some curiosity. Or uh, then there would be, you know, since you so love and admire someone like, for example, Roger Ebert, there would be Beyond the Valley of Dolls, which Ebert wrote, so you could get a few laughs out of that. Or, you know, simply porn films that actually try to tackle a political subject matter of its time. It was interesting to read about this golden age of porn, because it's a subject that I have not dug in too deep, no pun intended. And then also, I was surprised about the amount of critics praising these films at the time. Especially Roger Ebert was quite fond of porn films at the time. Uh, something that they might not be so excited to admit nowadays, where would uh, Roger Ebert actually be alive still? Yeah, I don't know if he ever truly felt ashamed of his background in, you know, covering porn. I, I, sure, af af after the man won his Pulitzer, it was very quiet time considering his porn days, but I also never ran into a statement where he would actively try to deny that during his early days he dabbled in porn and covered porn films. Tonight's film is the opening of Misty Beethoven. It's an American pornographic comedy film from 1976. Indeed from the golden age of porn, which lasted from 1969 to roughly 1984. The film is relatively high budget, Henrik. That's why it's called the golden age. The age when you were able to get porn in the theaters by the excuse of having art in your film. Or some kind of a plot device. Often not so edgy. But at the end of the day, these are still porn. Yeah, to my understanding, and of course I, I have to stress out that I'm somewhat only a hobbyist when it comes to the history of porn. In no way do I make a statement that I'm in any way in the same league, for example, like Rialto Report. But my dilettantian understanding is that this was the time period when porn started to become socially more accepted in America. To a point where, for example, an honest card American film actor could actually say out loud that he supports porn industry or make a statement considering porn films in general. And this was also the time period when there was more effort put into making a porn film. Not all of them, of course, there was a lot of really cheap and really shoddy films being made, but there was a honest to God attempt to kind of make them more highbrow, have bigger production budgets and actual film scores. Like in today's film, at least try to have a plot. As in today's film's case, try to have a plot which has a prestigious background supporting it. And also something that was emphasized during these years was the actual need of the actors actually managing to do at least some acting. So the productions were were kind of a more grandiose than they necessarily are today. They were, and often they were still filmed in a cheap format, 60mm, in, instead of the industry standard 35mm. It's a little bit that also the film quality looks cheaper, for example, in this film. But of course you can see that they are actually trying to make some kind of a film. Then again, at the same time, you kind of have to remember to make the notion that, in my opinion, there is a lot of mystification going on when it comes to covering the so-called golden age of poor. Right? This romanticized look at the era is something that I feel started to form in the major 
popular culture around the late 90s, when films like Boogie Nights were made and when we had the re-release of Deep Throat and Debidas Dallas and other these kind of a legendary board films. And uh, there is, of course, there is truth to that notion that during the Golden Age, more effort was kind of a put into porn, but it does still, in my opinion, when we look at the Golden Age, when we look at the porn of today, we tend to make the notion that during the Golden Age, there was production budgets and there was scripts were written and the productions were actually, honest to God, trying to do something within the porn genre. And this would be something that would completely, utterly be lost into the golden age. Something that does in no shape or form happen in today. And that is something where I would actually disagree. I, I would say that even today, every now and then, there does come a production that aims to kind of achieve the quality of these golden age films. Quite possible. I am not so familiar with the genre as you might be. But... Henrik, I'm fascinated by the level of the open sexuality in this movie. In some sense, you know, Hollywood should have at least taken some notes and and make sex in films a more open subject, perhaps. It's a good argument to be made. It would be good for the ticket sales, that's for sure. It could be good for the economy, would provide customer satisfaction, no pun intended, and would stop hiding articles of any grown man or woman or someone in the middle or hermaphrodite or such. Everybody knows what they look like. So in that sense, there, this is the last stigma. This is the last island, the last taboo of the film screen or one of those. And I'm looking for a proper argument why sex should be as taboo as it is now. Of course, nowadays it completely goes to insane levels, for example, where this is not a, about a film, of course, but just to explain the current stigmatization of sex or nudity. As we know in Instagram, famously, they pluck the nipples of a woman, but not of a man. It's sort of nonsensical when you start to really think about it. Then again, I, I would almost make the counter-argument to your first point of Hollywood kind of changing its attitudes. Because I would almost argue that the golden age of porn did have, in the end, a major effect in the Hollywood films. Could be. I mean, during this time, the, there was a honest to God fear that this more open acceptance towards porn and sexuality would eventually lead into the more prestigious Hollywood films and the real movies starting to implement sex and scenes of pornographic quality into them. Like the golden age and the porn industry would somehow tarnish the Hollywood films, the real movies. And I, I would say to a point that actually has happened in Hollywood films. Would you use the word tarnish? I would not use the word tarnish. Even though I'm not a huge fan of your sex scene in your average Hollywood film, I feel that they are mostly just pointless and merely just eye candy, which serve no actual purpose in the film. But I would still avoid using terms like tarnish to avoid taking part in the stigmatization of sex and even porn. But Hollywood films and their sex scenes, in my opinion, have changed pretty drastically when you compare films from 50s and 60s and the films of today. Simply look at Bond films and the sex scenes in Bond films. I would almost make the argument that you can actually see the attitude change in the way how sex scenes are being handled between, for example, Sean Connery era and then in the late Daniel Craig films like Spectre. Yeah, you can see that it has backpedaled, actually. In Sean Connery films, you can see more nudity, 
And you can also argue that it's a very sexist era in Bond films, and majority of it is. But look at any Daniel Craig films, and the nudity is quite off the books. Could be, could be, could be that I'm blowing smoke out of my ass. Like I said, you know, I, I used Spectre as a reference point, and I haven't watched Spectre in, ever since it came out in movies. Good, good. I can't blame you. I, I guess nobody can blame me for avoiding Spectre. Avoid your Spectres. But in the early ones, the women are treated more like objects, definitely. And with that comes also the nudity part, where women are thrown around the room like some kind of trash or animals or less worthy individuals around the room. So we're free to see pretty much all of the women's body. You can see the other sexual organ, but there is something stigmatized about the other one still. And here we can get to like endless discussions about now which sex is asexually thinking, I suppose, the better looking one. Or is the <laughs> human anatomy in a man so disgusting indeed, Henrik, that it just cannot be shown on screen? Well, the obvious answer is yes. No. Yeah, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I can't understand anyone having, you know, any problem with a pair of titties on the screen, but, you know, god damn, you know, you, you shove a penis on the screen, and yeah, that that's a definite no-go. It's not if also the rest of the body is adequate. <laughs> the, the male body is never ad- adequate in that sense. Why, Henrik? <laughs> you hit the gym and you look like a sculpture, so what's the problem? There's just something shaking around your lower parts of the body, but that's okay. It's what it is. It's nature. We watch animals doing it and being all naked in National Geographic, we can do it on the screen as well. Or can we? What what is the big taboo, Henrik? Uh, What's the big deal? Well, to actually, you know, to take the conversation seriously, Mm. for a change and stop just goofing around here, as a straight cis male, I, honest to God, can't actually say what is the big deal. Why it's being made into such taboo, my best guess in the matter would be that there is some kind of a cultural need for us to kind of a still mystify the sexual act. Yeah, and something important. It doesn't have to be so in your face. Like, no pun intended, again, as in Misty Beethoven. Because porn flick is a porn flick, but just like an action flick can have horror elements or vice versa. So why couldn't a horror flick have more visible scenes of humans having sex? It doesn't have to be a close-up. It doesn't have to get so intimate. It can be like a a long shot. It doesn't have to get overly sexual. It's just showing what the hell is happening. I I don't know if if it's some kind of a cultural point for us. Yeah. It's really hard for me to say on behalf of other cultures, so let me just take on the Western territory and simply to draw the line on this discussion simply on the Western world. But I, I don't know if, if there is something that we still feel that sex and sexuality and nudity is something shameful. At the same time as it's also kind of a hold into this higher regard in our minds. Where we see the act of sex, of having sex, as some kind of a holy proceeding. It, it's something more than just sex. It's combination of body and soul or something like that. And because of this, this mystification of sex and sexuality. Because of that, we would then feel ashamed when we kind of expose ourselves to sex in a more consumer level. That's why we hide our porn collections and delete our browser histories. That is why we would scoff when there is extremely open sex scene in a movie. That would be why it would be edgy in your teenage drama film to have scenes of graphic sex. Most people listening this must be thinking is that, you know, it's 
disgusting. They don't want to mix that with the movie. It's something obscene. It doesn't belong. But uh, then let me throw you something like this. What if it feels like that only for the reason that you usually hide most of your body? And for a good reason. It might be cold outside, weather conditions, protecting yourself, especially downstairs. I'm not speaking on, on behalf of adding more visible sex scenes to movies necessarily. But I, I would say there there might not be a good reason why you would not show more. I too am not actually advocating for adding more sex scenes into a movie. In In my case, it's a matter of preference. Since I do not actually hold the sex scenes within a film to that high regard, I view it usually as just an eye candy. Yeah. Which more often is meant to get the males in the audience excited about the film, about the possibility of, you know, catching a side boob. Well, without knowing too much about the, that side of the psychology, maybe there is a good argument to keep more visible sex scenes out of film, because then it would concentrate the audience's interest in entirely the wrong things when you're trying to tell an actual plot about something else than sex. Yeah, and my problem very largely stems from the fact that I don't feel that the sex scenes, in your typical Hollywood film, I don't feel that the sex scenes actually contribute that much to the film itself. It's not a plot point, it's not a character point, it does not have that much of an effect into anything in the film that would actually merit the sex scene since all the character evolution can actually be shown within the film without actually having to pad out the running length with two or three minutes of a Hollywood sex scene. But at the same time, of course, I also have to make the notion that that our pretty problematic attitude when it comes to sex when it comes to sex and sexuality, and this stigmatization of both, I actually feel is something where we still are on the wrong side of the discussion. We are making a mistake, in my opinion, when we stigmatize sex, and it's a mistake that I feel does actually hurt, and which has victims. It does affect on the uh, cultural notion on how we, for example, see porn films and therefore the porn actresses, where we see them as trashy, as less valuable. And it can also, you know, harm us in a way how we, the consumer end, approach our own sexuality and how we experience our sexuality since our, you know, consumption of sexual material is something that we feel that we should be ashamed of so then, in that sense, we'll partly end up being ashamed of something that is very natural part of our emotional and psychological self-image. Yeah, but surely there's a difference when you're an actress or an actor in a porn flick doing fellatio compared to you, uh, well, not, not you, but anyone in general, having some fun to a porn flick at home. You know, but so in the sense of should it be something stigmatized? And first we should untangle, distangle, why is it stigmatized? And should it be stigmatized? What is the reason for stigmatizing it? And for that end, I, like I said, I, I'm not unfortunately a professional on this matter, but maybe it, it is the shame factor. Maybe it's the fact that most of the Western civilization is based around Christian values and Christian mm. worldview. Possibly. Well, let's move on to the film. As mentioned before, this is considered to be a sort of a crown jewel of the golden age of porn. Jamie Gillis is playing Dr. Seymour Love. Very funny. Seymour Love. Get it? Get it? Get it? Get it? Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Notch, notch, <laughs> wink, wink. Appeared in over 470 films directed many adult films, openly bisexual, appeared in many gay porn movies, has also appeared in some quote-unquote decent films, 
such as Nighthawks from 1981. It's a crime thriller featuring Sylvester Stallone. I actually don't know if he should be kind of more quiet about his board career or the fact that he appeared in Nighthawks. In this podcast, we do not discriminate. Well, in this podcast, we actually can discriminate Nighthawks. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> this movie is in the adult film XRCO Hall of Fame. Also received the 2002 AVN Award for the Best Classic DVD. It's also argued that Misty reached the mainstream level in storyline and sets when it comes to porn. But I wouldn't say that because there were already flicks like this in the early 70s. Henrik can be more resourceful in this matter. I I would say in production value, yeah. I would merit Misty Beethoven the notion of the production values. It's kind of a globe-throating film. What about the Devil in Miss, whoever it was, film? As far as I can remember, the Devil in Miss Jones does not have as many and as grandiose vistas as Misty Beethoven. Okay. But that is simply the production values. I do have extremely big bone to pick with a notion of this hitting some kind of a storyline high marks. Deep Throat from 72 was the first to change the public attitudes apparently considerably towards porn, towards higher acceptance. And in the newspapers the title was as uh, quote-unquote powderized to throat. And before this golden age it was illegal in the US to buy the anti-obscenity laws to create distribute or consume pornography. And as mentioned, even Roger Ebert gave a favorable review for a 1973 film, the aforementioned The Devil in Miss Jones. Also, William Friedkin called it a great film, because it actually had some sort of a story. But it was just shortly after in the same year when the Supreme Court then ruled again of distribution of pornographic filmmaking storylines and conventions, the makers of these films were trying to use the argument of artistic merit against any possible charges for obscenity. And uh, these scenes were considerably more expensive than you would expect from a porn flick, at least nowadays. More laborers. Film setups often required that the actors had to film one scene for hours, and uh, this was a problem for male actors, as you could uh, understand. Because an erection had to be reached again and again between shots. Many actors turned to Viagra for help. Something that still hasn't that much changed in behind the scenes of porn. No, oh, sure. And o- only to a point where today's medical cocktails are even more advanced and it's not so much a popping of pill in your mouth than actually stucking needles into your dick. And you most definitely need your cocktails, Henrik, if you are Homosexual, as we know that in this film there was a lot of gays acting, for whatever reason, in intimate situations with girls, women. It is one of those, kind of a, it's one of those producing decisions that really makes you scratch your head and think, what the hell were they thinking? Maybe they needed the money. Well, uh, actually I'm ac- more interested in the production in of that decision, like, why would you cast gay actors into film where they are expected to have heterosexual intercourses? And visibly this was a problem for them. You can see in several scenes that it wasn't always so easy to... What's the euphemism for this one? They sometimes had trouble keeping it up. However, the golden age of porno was about to come to an end, Henrik. The social disapproval of Watching porn in any public gatherings was extremely strong. So strong that people even tried to subterfuge, camouflage themselves with fake mustaches. And then the VCR came rolling and became with its terrifying format and ended the golden age. This is because the viewing of a VHS was the easier and preferred choice because it allowed more privacy than going into the theater. Hence, porn again became low budget and even more 
inappropriate, one could argue. But there has been some attempts to get to the golden times every now and then. To me, the VHS and the way how it was met by the industry is kind of a, one of the many missed opportunities. Since if you ask me, the VHS boom and the very easy private consumption of pornographic material would have actually been something that would have actually helped the golden age a huge lot. And if something, instead of cheapening your production budgets and going once again backwards in how you produce pornographic material in the VHS age, I feel that would have been your golden ticket to actually try to make the productions even more grandiose. Yeah, it wasn't only about the VHS era. Indeed, Henrik, it was also about the stigmatization of the at least in the United States, if we are going to be US-centric in this podcast, in the United States. It was hard to push these films out, no pun intended, to theaters. So it was just easier to release it on home video. So once again, I have to ask the question, why the fuck did the industry actually then double down in the production budgets? Because... Even with the stigmatization, the VHS was much more easier to consume and get your hands on. It was also easier and probably cheaper to release on VHS, which would mean that the most of the high-end productions would end up in the sea of pornographic video production. And that actually holds very much water, that sentiment, because that most definitely did happen during the VHS times. But I still believe that had the industry hold it together, not be so quick to throw in the towel at that point, but would have actually tried to unify itself and still maintain the production of quality porn films, they would have managed to brand themselves in a way that certain high quality brands would have still sticken out from the sea of lesser quality entertainment. The question indeed arises, is there no way to publicize, uh, promote your film somewhere in such a way that you would rise out of the sea of the VHS? Because you also have to rise in the theatrically released releases, right? So it is an interesting point. Well, again, I'm not sure if you actually had to fight against the theatrically released films at that point any longer, because you were not forced, you were not demanded to fight over against who can actually fill in the seats in an actual movie theater. Correct. Yeah. Many layers to this. Why can't life be simple, Henrik? We can't answer this. Well, if it would be simple, we too would not have a podcast. Granted. Susie is our main actor. Her real name is Susie, surname is unknown to me, play name is Constance Money. There's a funny story related to the name Constance Money. She was asked what kind of a name she would want to have in this film, and well, Susie hated the name Constance. Supposedly when she was quite pissed off when she did not get paid for this movie, by her own words at all, she chose Money because... She wanted her damn money. She had very open discussions of sexuality in the family. And father was very disappointed to hear in what kind of films she was starring in. But family was relatively open. During the filming, Susie was in New York for three, four months. She had an interesting situation with Jamie Gillis. She said that he is standoffish and they did not film the sex scene until the very end when they were really angry at each other. During filming she was 19, I believe. And, uh, okay, to be perfectly correct, like, like we like to be in this podcast, she did not get paid at all, or she did get paid maximum 100 USD. And maybe got a plane ticket. Very interesting group of people. <clears throat> the production really was kind of a notoriously troubled. I listened to the... What is this group of people that you mentioned before? I listened to their podcast. Rialto Report. 
where Susie told her story for about a one hour was enlightening. Yeah, you really can't name drop the film crew here without mentioning Gloria Leonard, who at the start of her career was something like 35-year-old single mother, and then got into porn and finally end up being kind of this grand dam of porn with numerous films under her belt and publishing at least one magazine and pioneering the whole phone sex line industry with the 976 numbers. I remember hearing that she passed away recently, but until her death, she was someone who was very prominent industry figure and really is, you know, one of those great personalities to emerge from porn. And there is also, I guess we have to give credit where credit is due, also mention the director's Ratley Metzger's only, as far as I know, only non-porn film, the 1978 version of The Cat and the Canary, which is a weird comedy mystery horror hybrid. I myself have never seen Metzger's version, but I have seen the original silent film version and never liked the film all that much. Felt that it completely missed the mark on what it was trying to do. The comedy was not funny and it ended up actually harming all the tension in the horror scenes of the film. But yeah, Metzger did direct a colorful talky remake at the end of 70s. Would it be scene by scene, Henrik? I think we can't avoid it. The film starts with considerably lot meat on the screen. And then we get to a theater with some more of it. And Seymour, the Dr. Seymour Love, sexologist, who meets Misty in the theater. So they meet. They agree to meet outside of the theater a little later. They do. Seymour comes to the breeding center, as I like to call it this uh, hooker house, where he finds something special about Misty. And he wants to make Misty a very, very professional master of love. Yeah, the whole kind of a scene with the first scene with Seymour and Misty is a kind of a strange one. Since Seymour does make kind of the notion how he sees something, something spectacular in Misty, but he never actually manages to word out what that something is. And after that, Seymour goes on in a rant about this book he's supposed to write, which apparently is such of a long-running meme that even Seymour's friend, who he also finds from the whorehouse, has already heard the name of the this mysterious book for so many times that she remembers it outright. So in, in, in many ways actually Seymour here appears as a con artist. Yeah, the book is the Annals of Passion. Yeah, and uh, there's no goddamn notion about Annals of Passion except that this is some kind of a grandiose project that Seymour is yet to write. And apparently it has been a project for many years already. Quite honestly, I see nothing spectacular about Misty, but that could be just me. But it looks like Seymour has read the script, and that's enough for to get Misty rolled into the program. Maybe that's what the book is supposed to be all about. It's the script of the film, and Seymour is hacking it as they go along. Then they go to Seymour's place, or whatever it is, this uh, blowjob center and sculpture training. Or is it just plain old good old dildos? So Misty is getting the training, the first initial stages of it. Then we get to the flight. The flight is my favorite part of, of this film because of this stupid humor. I actually fucking hated the flight scene. Really? Maybe you have been exposed to enough of erotic humor that 
this might not be enjoyable to you at all. Actually, I have a huge, huge problem with this notion of repetition being funny. This is something that I've run into in many occasions, be it a theater production, be it a film, be it, you know, stand-up comedy. But every now and then I do run across some cultural person, your average playwright, your theater director, who has this, in my opinion, quite baffling notion that repetition of something makes the scene funny. The act of repetition in itself is funny. This reminds me of you mentioning the boats and hose quote in some earlier episode. That being, actually, that being one of the prime examples of someone taking the notion that, that simply by repeating something you make it funny. And goddamn, if not the humor in the plane scene here in the opening of the Misty Beethoven, once again tries to actually make the joke work simply by repeating lines. And it's not funny, it does not work. Repetition in itself. It's not funny, it's a shittier comedy, and you should avoid it unless you are something like Monty Python, and even Monty Python did not manage to make it right in every occasion. I did not find it repetitious. Actually, I'm quite fond of the line, quote, Do you think the pilot would give me some head? I don't know. I'll ask him as soon as we're through with the dinner service. Thank you. So, I can't see you not enjoying that line. Was it really that bad? To me, yeah, it was. It really was. And it, it actually, it does get even more worse. Was it on the second flight scene, which we have in the film? Oh yeah, well that's not worth mentioning, but the first one still goes. And uh, this film most definitely has a problem with objectifying women. Make no mistake about that. But if we take these quotes out of such context, in itself, I think it's moderately entertaining. But then again, if you look at the sexual organs in this film, I would say that the male sexual organ is the star. And the rest is kind of having a smaller role in this film. Would you agree? This film is concentrated on the penis. It very much is. Like the major running time when genitalia is being shown, it more often than not, it is the penis. But it is making the case that it's making the woman the subtype by, in my opinion, I'm not really into entering these dis- discussions usually, but it's it's pretty clear. Like the woman, the Misty is uh, the trainee who needs the training and has to suck several genitalia to pass the test. More than that, Misty is in actual training to actually learn how to please the penis. Exactly. Yeah. Like, mainly that. Yup. And for, like, most of the running time, you just see the guys lying on their backs and the woman pleasing them. And that is actually a bit troubling notion in this film. Since the storyline in itself tries to be about Misty kind of becoming this mystical performer of sexual favors. That somehow everybody knows in the streets now. Yeah, the entire world kind of knows Misty Beethoven after she starts to go through that training. But then again, once again, like you pointed out, The major thing where Misty is actually being trained is in pleasuring the men of the world. Absolutely, and then they get to the Rome estate, this fancy looking building. There are some scenes there, then there's a theater scene. Another test, it kind of went past me what kind of a test this is because Misty is not involved, right? But uh, there is that scene and then finally the pair goes into the lavatory and somebody in the theater makes the notions that there are difficulties for him sustaining his excitement so they go back and forth in the crowd ha 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 and the scene finishes off no pun intended the old woman comes to the lavatory to say i would have sucked him off in a telephone booth you terrible young 
people, how dare you be so obscene and do it here in the laboratory? Once again, that quality A comedy we are being <laughs> subjected to here. It seems that there are some major troubles getting Misty off the ground to the high fame. So Seymour, at least what I understood here is that's how it goes. Seymour then coaxes another woman in the beauty parlor to take an assignment. The assignment is to train Misty Beethoven to do it right. And then there is what I call the main sex training, where the instructor shows lady on lady how to properly do it. But for some reason, of course, then it's uh, Seymour and the instructor for the second time, you know, to, to get the point. But the rational approach of this film, Henrik, you know, the arguably failed attempts at procreation, sexual intercoursing stick too much time, at least from my perspective. If we would compare this to a horror film, the sex in those is kept to a tolerable length. But we, we get the point in the time they depict sex. Here it runs too long. I, on the other hand, I'm on the opposite end of the argument. Well, <laughs> how come? Of course, we we represent different ends of sexuality in this podcast, so this might be a natural reason. The way I see it is that this is a porn film. And in that sense, unlike in your horror film, where where the main focus is in the horror, creating dread and... More often than not, to show you the gruesome death and the body count building. In porn, the major focus is the sex. Sure. And in Misty Beethoven, the sex usually does not take that long. I mean, most of the sex scenes, Misty Beethoven is loaded with sex scenes. Don't get me wrong here, but mm. most of the sex scenes are quick cuts into a sexual act like you get outside of the main scenes you get like two to five second inserts of sex to drive home the point i'm trying to make here is the for example the opening scene of this film which essentially follows seymour as he's walking down the street and into a theater that plays a pornographic films that's essentially what happens in the opening of the film. So, what you get here is scenes with Seymour walking, intercutting with two to three second scenes of sex. You follow Seymour walking, sex happens somewhere. You follow Seymour walking, sex happens somewhere. You follow Seymour walking, sex happens somewhere. That's the opening act of the film. And in there, the, my problem is... And this is something that I usually have a problem with this kind of a golden era of porn films, this vintage porn. You, you have a scene where something is happening and there is cut-ins to a, some random sex scene that has nothing at all to do with the scene you are actually following. And the cuttings mm. are such of a short length that you actually can't even, you know, get your dick out before the scene actually ends. And that's what constantly happens in Misty Beethoven. Later on in the film, once they get to the Rome estate, there are scenes with Seymour walking through the estate, having dialogue, expressing something that he's trying to say out loud, and then you get a glimpse of a maid sucking off the butler. It's three seconds, and it's quickly forgotten, Seymour walks somewhere else, continues his monologue, and once again, somewhere outside of the, you know, at the end of the p image, you once again see someone performing sex. Here is the difference in approach, Henrik. Are we willing to look for a porn film that has a sustaining sex scene from beginning to end all the time, sequence to sequence, or are we looking for something that, you know, explores adding sex as a perfectly acceptable daily occurrence into your scenes, but not keeping the focus on completely that. There's always something else happening around you. And I just might prefer watching the latter. And I can understand that, since the latter actually gives you, or could give you, 
It does not do that in the case of Mr. Beethoven, in my opinion, but it could give you more, you know, plot and more of the character. If you're looking for, of course, stroking sexual organs, then that's another thing. That's uh, what we would call the Jynkkyleffa. But this is trying something else. Yeah, and still it tries to identify itself as porn. We are supposed to watch the golden age of porn here. And something I would say is kind of missing in our porn is the goddamn porn. (laughs) I wouldn't say that. I'm not against the porn having plot or characters. I'm not saying that. That's not my argument. But I'm saying that these two to three second quick cuts of sexual intercourse is something that does not actually have the effect that, you know, a porn should have. Hmm. You, you don't have the opportunity to check yourself off in two to three seconds. Without the adequate background check, I would say that There is no scientific consensus for which format would be the better. It's just what you're individually looking for. So we hit a brick wall in this argument. Well, yeah, yeah, we might hit a brick wall. This may be something where we actually have to perform an academic study. So in in that case, dear listeners, if you are interested in joining our test group on the matter... (laughs) Is two to three seconds of sex on a film enough to get you off? You know, please PM us in this podcast. The the test groups are being (laughs) being combined later this year. When we (laughs) open the Facebook thread discussion for this (laughs) film, I can't wait for your comments. (laughs) Well, after this main training, Misty says that, oh, she cannot do it. And Seymour dumps the wine to the ground. Seymour says she wants to go for a dinner anyway when all of this is over and he is trying to convince Misty to continue going and Misty is surprised that Seymour wants anything to do with her after this is all over. And then we get to the main test. Having sex with a gay, is it, painter in Geneva. Yeah, as far as I understood. Yeah. From the low quality audio. I'm being subjected to here. Me too. Yeah, the painter indeed is a homosexual. And this is basically a sexual orientation correction for the painter. Not questionable at all. There are definitely the audio quality problems. I often had trouble hearing what was being said in a particular scene. You can see that there's some trouble with that uh, object that the woman is having an interesting time with, but then the word comes around that she actually has sexual intercourse so well that he went straight, and his friends have asked him to see a psychiatrist. Mm, interesting twist. Not completely unheard in the world of cinema. Probably not. Very questionable stuff hearing it now. A bit eyebrow raising, but it's a comedy after all, so I'm not going to get big reading into that. Uh, There there again, you know, to highlight the problematicness of the scene, this is kind of the exact same plot point that also happens in Goldfinger, in the porn films. (laughs) (laughs) So. It was never established that she would be a lesbian. (laughs) It It was was in the books. It was in the goddamn books. Okay. Oh, got me. Yeah, and then basically Sean Connery, well, it's like he forcefully starts kissing her and then magically it's all over. She gives up. Okay, kiss me then. Now we're the perfect couple. You know, any homosexual or youth left winger who has seen this scene with me has been like, oh, Jesus Christ. But, yeah, it it was a different time back then. Most definitely was. (laughs) Yeah. But, yeah, after the gay painter scene, the movie once again tries to kind of pick up its plot and tries to be some kind of a, you know, a character piece in a sense. And this is where the film kind of starts to build up its conflict between Misty and Seymour. 
There are notions that Misty is somehow interested in Seymour and feels heartbroken that Seymour in no way seems to give Misty any recognition and instead is just patting himself on the back and hugging all the glory. Which is unbelievable since we see how horribly, horribly by words Seymour is treating Misty. He is calling her a cunt after all. In the end. Yup. Yup. And they somehow become a kind of a couple. At least in the end scenes, Seymour is now in a more of a slave position. So the roles have switched. So we get kind of this preferable solution. The evil guy has been uh, made to subservient. Or something since it's never actually brought up what the hell happens at the very end of the film. But before the end of the film, there is indeed the party. And there is again a random scene of apparent gay person. And actually, there is the fact that it's not completely without its gayness, this film. You know, there's an attempted re-entry into the bottom of this guy with the dildo. So there's that. I somewhere actually came up with the notion that this was supposed to be the first film or one of the first films to show female on male begging. Okay, could be. So that's the point where we hit the cultural landmark here with the Misty Beethoven. After this one, it's immediately right back into Seymour calling Misty with names and taking all the credit on how great a lover Misty has become. But just before that, there is some woman having the fellatio. And then is it again another woman having the fellatio with him and then bites the head of the sexual organ of Mr. Seymour. And uh, But this is not Misty, right? Some other woman. And he's complaining about Misty to her all the time. And then she gets enough of that. No, actually, as far as I'm to go with the image quality, I would say it is Misty. So how it goes is that there is the sexual intercourse at the party, followed by Seymour offhandingly trash-talking about Misty and hogging all the credit about everything that's happened in the film this far. And this is where they have the big breakup, where Misty makes the notion that she is leaving Seymour, and Seymour remarks something like, you can't leave the Caesar. And Counter reacts that where does she need Caesar when she has Napoleon? Yeah. Yeah, tying it back to the very beginning of the film where Misty was shown as this very low-class prostitute who masturbates an old guy who dresses up as Napoleon. Yeah, or Caesar, or whatever. Yeah, and this comes into a conclusion when Simo returns to the Rome estate, now somehow realizing that he loved Misty all this time, or some crap like that, and <laughs> Misty for some odd reason secretly returns to Rome to Seymour and prepares to suck his cock, and Seymour immediately once again starts to trash talk about Misty, at which point Misty bites his dick. Like mentioned, one of the last scenes filmed for this film, in my understanding, yeah. Because of they weren't in good relations in real life during the filming. Yeah. And I, I can't see how they could be in good relations even within the universe of this film. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense to me. Susie, I'm afraid you are not much of a actor. You're not much of a character in this film to be chosen for this <laughs> great sex mission. Seymour, I don't see your affection for her. Yeah, and script-wise, the whole kind of a concept, they love each other, kind of comes absolutely nowhere. Yeah. Which, in my opinion, is a sticking point in Misty Beethoven, because, like many have made the notion, this is supposed to be one of those hallmarks of porn, where the script really matters, and where there was a strong emphasis on the quality of the script. On the level of porn films still, I might add. So, 
It's a it may be a hallmark in that sense, yeah. Yeah, then again, I'm not willing to give it that much credit. What would you give credit for then? <sighs> the hard questions in this podcast. Yeah. The main problem I have with the story of Misty Beethoven is the fact that it's not an original story. Well, everything is an adaptation, and it's usual not, to have an adaptation. Not to this point. I mean, this is... In the end, Misty Beethoven is based on the play, Pygmalion, which then again later on has actually been considered one of the greats and which has had numerous adaptations made out of. Most of the 1956 Broadway play and the 1964 film adaptation known as My Fair Lady. Like that, that is the groundwork where Misty Beethoven comes off. And in my opinion, since that is already a story structure that has been presented and laid out, and Misty Beethoven is aiming to be an adaptation of Pygmalion, or more notably, My Fair Lady. And then Misty Beethoven, in my opinion, goes on and completely mishandles the main plot points. Both Pygmalion and My Fair Lady. To a point where, story-wise, this adaptation makes no goddamn sense, and where the troubling aspects of the original work are actually presented even more troublingly. This being the subject of male ego and the importance that male ego plays in the proceedings of the story. The ego of the main male character in My Fair Lady's case, for example, is that of Professor Henry Higgins, the male lead of the film. And the story itself, of course, is a love story, but there, in my opinion, there always has been this troubling undercurrent where Higgins realizes his affection towards the Elisa Doolittle, My Fair Lady's Misty Beethoven, through kind of a damage done to his ego. Like, there is that undercurrent, if you ask me, in the love story of My Fair Lady. And then comes Misty Beethoven which takes the exact same kind of a hole where to land on, tries to follow this plot point and somehow manages to make it even more about the main male lead's ego. Because in Misty Beethoven, the whole goddamn Seymour realizing that he has grown feelings towards Misty appears to be a simply a result of Misty damaging his ego. With a Napoleon quote. Hmm. So you have an adaptation of an already existing story that A. Mishandles the plot points. And, and the story structure proper to a point where I, I would say that this is a lackluster adaptation of the original story. And B. Then you come off and you manage to make some of the troubling aspects of the original story even more troubling. And that is the major axe I have to grind with Misty Beethoven. And that's the movie. That's the movie. Had this been an original story, and not an adaptation of Pygmalion, I most likely would have been more kind to Misty Beethoven's story, and I would have been more ready to look some things, you know, through my fingers and not be so nitpicky on how the story proper proceeds and handles itself. But Misty Beethoven deliberately is not an original story, it's an adaptation. And I would say that as an adaptation, this is quite bad. Did you find any psychology points or symbolism in this film that we could discuss? <laughs> not outside of the troubling aspects that we have already tackled on, that being the male ego and the Correcting the gay man's sexual identity. Do we have reality checks? Movie versus science? Well, it's a comedy. So, in that sense, we still do not have ladies in the plane that offer sexual services for the travelers. I, I would also make the argument that that's not exactly how sex works. Yeah, at least right now. 
it's not taking as uh, some kind of a commodity as say smoking and rightfully so probably yeah that's a talking point i'm perhaps not completely ready to walk into yeah music the music is actually pretty good in this film that it is music is something that i'm willing to give points <laughs> And overall, the production values, I think, are pretty high quality in Misty Beethoven. Premiere and box office. I do not have records. I somehow am not at all surprised by this. I would almost make the case that at the box office records of the film are so completely lost to the times that they would be completely impossible to find. Also about the budget, I could just find the quote that it's it was relatively high budget, but which kind of budget? Unknown. Apparently, still not that high of a budget, seeing how seeing how Constance money, for example, was not being offered salary. Like you pointed out, there are two notions, and nobody actually knows for certain. Which case is the true? Was there no salary at all, or was it the hundred bucks? But whichever the case, based on my understanding and research on this film, I can vouch for the fact that she never got a hundred bucks a day. Hundred bucks total, I would say, is the best she got out of this film. Yeah. Well, she was angry. Definitely after this finished. I would be right <laughs> out of my mind angry, I would imagine. Doing something like this and not getting anything in return. Yeah, and to add insult to injury, I also heard that the director shot scenes that were not used in mm -hmm. this film, mm -hmm. but which he then went on and used on his later films. Without permission. Without any permission from Constance. How was the pacing of this film? Of this movie, I should say. There's a definition for film and movie, I would say. You use film for something that has some kind of a artistic quality merit to it. And movie is just a movie. This is a movie. Well, it tries to be a film. It aims at being a film. Hmm. And I'm willing to give this one that much. I can acknowledge that it tries to be a film. It tries to be something more and something more artistic. Were we entertained by the dialogue? I think the dialogue was higher than average in these kind of films, for to be sure, but the acting is terrible. Jamie Gillis does the best performance, I can already say. Well, well, it did have dialogue, so that, that is something. But outside of the line, where do I need Caesar when I have Napoleon, I really don't feel that the dialogue hit any kind of a noticeable high marks at any given time. It had dialogue, but it did not have anything that would really shine through. How was the cinematography for us? You can see the effort. There are some, uh, okay, establishings. I feel... Uh, yeah, there's nothing special to say about the in, in, when I think about some of the interiors. The cinematography, in my opinion, does actually manage to be quite good. It tries to achieve quite a lot. It's okay. Yeah, there are a lot of different types of shots. There are these artistic shots with Misty and Seymour hanging around, for example, the background wall sculpture which they have in the Rome estate. Like, there is your artistic shots, and then there are stationary camera shots from inside a car as they are driving, and there are okay establishing shots. So in that sense, the cinematographer actually tries to pull it off and really tries to do something with the camera here, and he manages to do okay job. And, well, this being porn, I can say that this is some of the best cinematography I've seen. And in that sense, let's get the name out. So, cinematography by Paul Glickman, but listed as Robert Rochester. Additional trivia. Well, there are usually some very unsurprising ways to go 
as a porn actor. Casey Donovan died of AIDS in his 40s. Jamie Gillis died of melanoma, though, in his 60s, so these guys are gone. Technicality. Well, the film, Henrik the film. There's some weird distorted images in the shots. It's one interior shot. And you can definitely see that the image gets distorted on the left and right sides of the picture for some reason. It looks like the film is of a pretty low quality. Throughout even the brighter sections it's really grainy, really fuzzy. Seems like in the mastering process they were not able to get it quite sharp. Must be because of the extreme graininess. Well, Henrik, this was released on DVD. It was also released on Blu-ray, shot on 16mm as mentioned, blown up to 35mm for certain purposes. There are some different versions of this film. There's a softcore version, a version cut by the British authority BPFC. It's a cooler softcore version. Adds some several scenes to to pad the running time. There's a scene of servants celebrating at the Italian villa or via in cave person outfits and some other bullshit in a tub and who cares then there's a extended italian edition by nocturno then the scenes that were cut from all editions that are available these are viewable on dvd and blu-ray or at least dvd by distrip picks and the blu-ray version that's the best version of course that you can get It's a transfer from the original negatives. A pretty good uh, transfer in that sense. What you can get out of this kind of film. 2K transfer. Unfortunately there are no the opening of Misty Beethoven video games. Anything about the legacy of Misty? I'm not sure if there is that much of a legacy to talk about. Yeah, I guess nothing that we haven't already mentioned in the sense that it, it helped in the opening of Attitudes. It did or it did not. On its part. Or not. Yeah, I mean, well, when we talk about the opening of the Attitudes, we have to take the notion that Misty Beethoven is just one part of the golden age of porn, and it. I would say that it's not just one film, it's just the golden age all together which helped with the Attitudes. Well, this is appropriate. Let's get to the quickies. Favorite performance of Misty goes to... I would say Constance Money. Oh. I would still say Jamie Gillis. I mean, that, Constance Money's performance in the early scenes in the whorehouse, it's uh, absolutely atrocious. That it is. Then again, I would almost make the case that every performance here is more or less atrocious at times. Ditto. Favorite scene? <laughs> <laughs> I like the most of the humorous material in the airplane, as mentioned. So, first airplane scene, on the whole. The discussion with the lady on the plane with Jamie Gillis. I guess I, for my part, would have to go with the more artistic shots with Misty and Seymour hanging around in the Rome estate. Favorite quotes? Just that one, you know, where do I need Caesar when I have Napoleon? I will still go with, do you think the pilot would give me some head? I don't know. I'll ask him as soon as we are through with the dinner service. Thank you. It was not anyway funny. It was. It, it was not. It was. Did it, like, this, this is the reason why we will never be able to cover comedies on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite kill. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Seymour's ego at the end of the film. Like that got brutalized. Uh, a part of my soul was killed watching this in my mom's flat. <laughs> <laughs> so, how how did you explain that to your mom? Sorry. I was a good boy, I went to the kitchen and she never saw me. <laughs> I never talked about it. What? what not, not the discussion about how you have to actually see this one because it's work. <laughs> For the podcast. <laughs> This time, uh, <laughs> uh, believe it or not, I didn't mention that, hey, mom, we are doing an episode about a porn film. It's good to think that your mom does not follow this podcast then. Yeah, uh, our poor fans uh, <laughs> our wonder poor about fans. the repercussions. 
I I I don't know if we have to put some kind of a not say for work disclaimer on this episode. <laughs> yeah, I will do something. As for the preview image for this episode, I have to look for something decent. Well, that's easy. You can just use the official poster of the film. Oh, but that would uh, break some kind of a laws. How about a church boat? <laughs> how, how original. <laughs> first image that comes to mind of Mist. It's the old guy who has dressed up as Napoleon. It has been burned into my retina forever. Well, we have to be honest in this podcast, so it's what you see most of the running time here, so lots and lots of man meat everywhere. Uh, Arguably loads more than the other type of reproductive organ. And that's, you know, it is what it is. (laughs) It's not a good thing. Well, you know, it it depends on your preferences. Who am I to judge? What took us out of this film? Well, it's hard to hear the goddamn dialogue often, so I was totally out of the plot for some moments. It could be that I missed nothing at all of importance, though. In my case, the first time I checked my watch was at the 30-minute mark of the film. <laughs> and I just kept checking it throughout the film simply out of pure boredom. Uh, This might be my first film where I have to also say that when it comes to watch, yes, I did look at my watch on several occasions and noticing myself sighing throughout the film. Which is kind of a sad since this is not a very long film. It's like an hour and a half max. Exactly. I was like, oh, it's just one hour, 20 minutes. So good. It will be a pretty good, easy way to cover this film. But no, what pulled us in? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well, it did have occasional titty every now and then. <laughs> well, I don't know. I can't name anything in particular. It was a pretty stale watch. Uh, and that that's uh, actually a sad fact with Misty Beethoven. It is a stale watch, as you said it. Yeah. Scissors of Sagrilich. What would you change in the film? Well, I would um, improve the audio editing and recording. Perhaps try to shoot the film in a better format or film than what we have here, because it looks pretty pedestrian, in the lack of a better word. As for modifying specific scenes, for like content, I can't tell. Well, to take the content point, my two main gripes with the film is the fact that this is not an original story, it's an adaptation. And I feel that it's a lackluster adaptation, so my first change would be a script rewrite, at which point I would attempt to make an original story. I would change the story totally. Henrik, would you recommend the opening of Misty Beethoven? That actually is quite a tricky question, because it's actually it's a question that ties into the format of our podcast. And the way how we deal with the films, would I recommend a film? Because that's how we end our episodes here. We either give a recommendation or we do not. We do not give, for example, a grade, one to five stars or anything like that. We simply give out a recommendation or not. And that question in itself holds a second question to us, which we have to Mm. ask ourselves. Mm. Why would I recommend or not recommend a film? And that's a tricky one to answer in the end, because that is a question which you can't simply cover with the technical aspects of a movie. Yeah, like in in general, I recommend watching films, and it's always good to delve deeper into the film history, which undoubtedly this film is part of. So, yeah, there is that. Should I rephrase it first for you? No, no, do, I, do. I think, the, think the question is good. Okay. The, my main notion is the fact that technically okay film is something that is easy to create on a one to five stars. You give it a three star. It does nothing spectacular, but it does not do nothing wrong. It Technically it's okay, so it's three stars and you reserve your ones and your twos to some films that actually do fuck up. But being technically adequate film is not still something that you can say that that's why you recommend it. If someone would ask you, mm. why would you recommend 
this film to me, if you simply answer to him, well, it's okay the made movie. But that's a shit answer. Like, and because of that question, would we recommend it? We have to kind of, we have to find the reason why we would recommend or not recommend any given film. And up until this point, it has been pretty easy task to us because it's been quite easy to find something in any given film that has some merit. It's culturally important. It's something that you don't see every day. It touches a political subject that is not that often covered, or it raises interesting philosophical questions, or something like that, that which you can use as a reasoning to why give a film a recommendation, or vice versa, we have covered films that somehow fuck things up so badly that you you take the recommendation all. Like, for example, the season, Halloween 3 season of The Witch, which I felt, despite the interesting philosophical questions and points, the third act and the final payoff is so goddamn lackluster that it hurts the actual points, and therefore I did not recommend it. Mm. But then we come into Misty Beethoven, which falls into the genre of porn. It's a vintage porn film. So you can't actually, you know, hold it to the same, under the same lens as we, you would, for example, look at the apocalypse now. That would simply not be fair since this Misty Beethoven aims to be a completely different movie, a different type of movie. And we have to look Misty Beethoven as a porn film and approach the question, would I recommend it from that? So Misty Beethoven is really well made vintage poor. That much I'm willing to give to the film, but at the same time, I have to make the notion that porn as an entertainment has surpassed the golden age, has surpassed the vintage era. Today's porn is more fetishized, it's more kinky, it's more extreme, overall it's more exciting. So why, why would I recommend anyone to check out a vintage porn? And there are, of course, there are answers to give to that. Uh, you, you could watch it simply because during the Golden Age, there was the mafia and the law enforcement went head to head behind the scenes of any given films. So like, for example, mafia was tied into making of Deep Throat. So you might want to check it out because of that, because the intrigue of crime and law enforcement and all the background stories that go behind there. You could watch vintage porn to see how porn tackled societal themes, like for example your Russ Myers and see how porn dealt with, for example, fascism and depicted Hitler. Or you could even go, you know, to absolute minimums and simply watch a film like Beyond the Valley of Dolls to see the film which was written by Roger Ebert. All those are valid points to check out a vintage porn, but none of those points apply to Misty Beethoven. As far as I know, there was no drama between the goddamn FBI or the law enforcement. There was drama between the production crew, but even that was not that exciting and it's not that well documented. In my opinion, this does not tackle that many societal themes. And, well, Roger Rebert had nothing to do with the film. So, in the end, I can't see that added value in Misty Beethoven. It's well made. It's, it's well made vintage porn, but there is nothing more to that. Right. Yeah, to validate my recommendation. So, in that notion... No, I, I would not recommend opening of Misty Beethoven. Watch modern porn. It's, it's more suited to your taste. It's more extreme. It's more exciting. You know, don't spend your money on the Blu-ray of, of the Misty Beethoven. You know, use it on a Prazor's Pass. You know, you, you can get, what, like, three-day trial of Prazor's with one dollar. It's, it's like... You know, <laughs> take take that deal over Misty Beethoven. Yeah, like you said, like I'm not sure why we should be extremely fixated on particularly Misty Beethoven. Of course, it was interesting to get 
<laughs> deep into the subject of the golden age of porn. And this was a area that I, I had not entertained before. So it was interesting to, you know, understand how the golden age began and how it ended, what happened. But why are we fixated on this particular movie? Because because the most of the critics tell us to watch exactly this film. That this is the high point of this season. And it is made in the middle point of the golden age. So it, the blocks seem to fit. So in a sense it's cultural history. But why should you exactly watch this film to understand the cultural history? I wouldn't say that you would need to watch the opening of Misty Beethoven to understand this period of time. I wouldn't say that you will enjoy this film. It's not high on like production values for a porn flick, yes. But it's not. The acting is nothing to write home about. It's not very funny even, if I mentioned this one particular quote. So, you can go through the movie. I don't think you have to go through all of it, because I don't think you will find it that interesting. As you said, if you want to have that that gratification sexually from something, then for God's sake, don't watch the opening of Misty Beethoven. And to pinpoint this as the thing to watch from this period, I just can't pull myself to quite do it. Because why? Go to Wikipedia, read about it, watch a documentary. There's plenty of porn documentaries out there. No, no, no. You, ah, I wouldn't recommend the opening of Misty Beethoven. I can't find enough reasons to do it. The Golden Age, in many ways, it was extremely interesting time period. And it is something that I do feel merits to be studied yeah. and looked upon. It's kind of a shameful to admit here, but originally, even for us, the Misty Beethoven covering porn in here in Flick Lab was a notion that we made jokingly. It originated as a joke, which we yep. simply carried over. And since we already talk about the stigmatization of sex, I think that was something where we kind of dropped the ball. Like, we, we started this whole thing on a wrong notion, since we started to look into the porn film as a joke. And I don't know, you know, now recording this episode, I'm, I'm actually thinking that maybe at some point we should actually take a second go with, with porn in Flick Lab. Like, we should maybe watch another film from the Golden Age or somewhere, uh, also to give a porn a treatment where we do not originate the idea as a joke. And, you know, maybe it would even be an interesting episode to make to cover a porn film and actually try to have an old Finnish porn star as a guest and well, draw, yeah. draw a discussion from that point. You're right, it's an, it's an era of film, that's a matter of fact, that's why we are covering it now, this Misty Beethoven. This was not chosen as a joke, it was something that I tried to study and arguably since it has all these merits that have been attributed to it, it has a valid point being in this podcast, but like you said, actually there's been some interesting uh, experimentation in film in the 2000s. Memory is failing me in remembering the title of this film, but there is one film where they try to bring porn... It's not really a porn film, it's, it's just sex shown in pure daylight as it is without hiding it in this film with... Uh, somewhat remotely interesting storyline. So it's even more about the story than the Misty Beethoven. So, yeah, let's take another go at some point, whichever film it ends up being. Yeah, because even though we gave Misty Beethoven, in my opinion, a fair treatment, and we did get serious about the topic, and we did do our fair share of background work, and I would almost argue that anyone who listens to this episode already has found our take on porn film extremely dull and boring. And not, <laughs> yeah, not, well. not, not nearly as much as toilet humor as you would expect. So in yeah. that sense, in the end, we did take the subject matter seriously, and we did treat the film and the industry 
or at least aimed. Once again, it's for others to judge how we put it off, but we tried to take the industry seriously and with respect and also the film. But yeah. in this process, you know, during the time when I was preparing for this episode and doing my background work, I realized that when I originally stated that we haven't watched porn here in the Flick Lab, uh, I did it as a joke. That, that was a joke back then. And it did kind of bother me when I was preparing to th for this episode because I did not originate the idea of us covering a porn film here in the Flick Lab. So, so are you saying that the Halloween porn film is no-go? <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying. I, I, I still feel that that actually would be something that we should have actually covered when we went through the Halloween franchise. They are weird offspring of the main franchise. There are many, like the Pirates of the Caribbean and you name it. These days, yeah, the whole porn parody has become its completely own subgenre. Yeah, but to say about this episode, I also came really prepared for this episode. Like, kind of hoping that this would not get out of hand. Like it would be a lot of just joking around about the film and porn in general. And as usual, I ruined it for everybody. Sorry, so I took it as seriously as I could look at this piece. And hopefully we did manage to pull it off. The jury belongs to you, dear listener. Yeah, if you are still listening to this episode, I guess in that case we actually failed and this somehow became a jokey episode since you are still listening to us and have not yet shown out and just quit with this episode. <laughs> well, changing gears once again for the next time, Henrik. What's our next film? Would it be actually Pretty Village, Pretty Flame? A highly acclaimed film about the Bosnian-Serbian war. I sure know how to pick them. I know, Henry. <laughs> you, you I sure know. know. <laughs> this is going to be a interesting headache. But a um, subject that I've been wanting to jump into for quite a while now. So that's what we're going to do. And after that, hopefully we get something, you know, as you said, easier. Just remember that the emotional, societal and political scars from that war still run extremely deep even today yeah so that is the package that we are we are dragging with us <laughs> to the next episode yeah with a serbian film that actually is going to as i understand it is going to include some humor in the aspect as well so we try very hard to not offend anyone and to guide us into the right path hopefully it's going to be a serbian guest in that episode as usual, keep in touch via email, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. Well, as a joke, this morning I actually opened up a Google Plus account for us, Henrik. So even that is <laughs> open. <laughs> you know, Google Plus is going to shut down in a matter of few months. But, uh, you know, let's enjoy it while we can, shall we? Thanks for joining us and see you next week. Hopefully on a lighter note. Or oh, then most definitely not. <laughs>